let me start with a welcome to everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. And uh, let me start also, because I'll forget later, with a reminder for everyone to uh, close their cell phones, uh, or at least to put them on uh, silent so we don't, we don't have any disruptions. Uh, my name is Larry Garber, and I'm the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the New Israel Fund, uh, which is co-hosting this event today with the New American Foundation. Uh, the New Israel Fund is the leading funder of progressive social change organizations in Israel with a particular focus on civil rights, social justice, and religious pluralism. In addition to grant making, we provide capacity building assistance to hundreds of Israeli non-governmental organizations through Shatio, our empowerment and training center. We also implement a number of cutting edge projects addressing various challenges to Israeli democracy. Here in the United States, we see our mission as educating the American public regarding the challenges facing Israeli democracy and what is being done in response. Nomi Chazan, who will introduce more formally in a minute, and you will hear from shortly, is the president of the National New Israel Fund Board. Our partner today is the New American Foundation, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy institute that vest, invests in new thinkers and new ideas to address the next generation of challenges facing the United States. New America emphasizes work that is responsive to the changing conditions and problems of our 21st century information age economy. In era shaped by transform <coughs> transforming innovation and wealth cre creation, but also by sh shortened job tenures, longer lifespans, mobile capital, financial imbalances, and ri rising inequality. And there is no better example of what New American is about than Daniel Levy, a senior fellow and director of our Middle East in, in, of the Middle East Initiative at the New American Foundation. Our focus today <coughs> is on the U.S.-Israeli relationship in light of Barack Obama's election as President of the United States and the upcoming February 10th elections in Israel. Will the Obama election influence in any, in any manner the Israeli elections? What are the expectations of the Israeli pe peace camp? Why does the right, according to various polls, seem to be gaining strength in Israel? And what is the likelihood of a new progressive party emerging in Israel and making itself felt as a new government is formed following the elections? To answer these questions and others that may be posed, we have as our principal speaker, Naomi Chazan. Naomi served for 12 years in the Israeli Knesset, including six years as deputy speaker as a representative of the Meretz party. She is a longtime peace and civil rights activist who has been involved with founding several outstanding organization, organizations in Israel and playing, playing a leadership role in many others. She is also an accomplished political scientist who has written and lectured about many subjects uh, in international affairs. She is now the head of the Department of Government and Society at the Academic College of Tel Aviv and Yafo. Following Nomi's presentation, Daniel Levy will offer his comments and perspectives in addition to <coughs> and, and perspectives. In addition to serving as the director of the Middle East Peace Initiative here at New American, Daniel is also the director of the Prospects for Peace Initiatives at the Century Foundation. During the late 90s, he worked as a senior advisor to former Prime Minister, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and to former Justice Minister Yossi Balin, and was a member of various Israeli negotiating delegations. Daniel is also the lead drafter of the Geneva Initiative, which I'm sure most in this audience are quite familiar with. And so without any further ado, let me invite Naomi Chazan to the lectern. Uh, thank you, Larry, and thank you <coughs> for New America Foundation for this invitation, and for all of you for coming. I, I was told to talk for 20 minutes, so I assume that gives me license to speak for 30. <laughs> and, uh, but but I, w I, I will speak almost telegraphically because there's quite a lot to cover, and I assume you want uh, to uh, press me on certain points, so I might as well put all the points before you. So I'll start with the obvious puzzle. Uh, the United States is in political transition. Israel, once again, is in political transition, and the Palestinian Authority is in political transition. 
So on the one hand, we have a political transition occurring in the three major players in the Arab-Israel conflict. Not the only players, but the three major players. On the other hand, there's an assumption all the time that when there are political transitions, they necessarily affect the peace process. And therefore, people are so interested in what's going on at, uh, primarily in Israel at this point because you've now resolved at least the direction of, of your transition in the United States. So what I want to do is to uh, give you some insight into the evolving Israeli political campaign and to examine the connection uh, to the United States and uh, to the possibility of the resumption of a serious negotiating process that will result in an agreement. And again, I'm not talking just about a negotiating process. I'm talking about the possibility of an agreement, because otherwise I think it's, it's just so many words. We're not at the stage anymore that we really should talk about processes. We have to talk about conclusive processes that yield results. Uh, I, 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 what, what I intend to do is I'll, I'll speak very briefly uh, about some of the causes for the lack of success in Annapolis because I need to frame the analysis. Then I will talk about what's going on in the Israeli political scene today. And then I will talk about what this means for uh, reinvigorating a, a constructive and successful uh, negotiating process. And I want to start off with by saying that after the following sentence, you are entitled to leave. And the following sentence is that I see next to no connection between what will unravel or take place in Israel in the next two and a half months and uh, the moves that are necessary for uh, jump-starting and completing a successful negotiation. And that is a very strong statement, so I'm putting it in, for me, very calm tone of voice, okay? And I, 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 I want this, that, that puts me in very directly into why have, has in the past year nothing really transpired in the negotiations. And I'm not saying that people aren't talking. The talking is going on consistently, persistently, on a variety of levels, all the time. But there is no output to date. And I think it behooves us once again, and it's not the first time in the last 10, 20, 30 years that I've been coming to Washington to discuss <coughs> these issues, that I have to address the question of why not. The prime reason that people have decided that nothing is moving at the moment is the political weakness of the two main parties, of the Israelis and the Palestinians. This has been the focus of the majority of interesting analyses recently. And the argument goes as follows. It is unclear whether in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority, the leadership has the will to reach an agreement. But most often, there is assumption today that there is a will to reach, achieve an agreement, but no capacity to do so for internal political reasons. And therefore, the political factor for the lack of movement in recent months has hinged primarily, not exclusively, but primarily on internal politics. I will not discuss the Palestinian side of the equation, but I will discuss the Israeli side, okay? I think there are five other major factors that are brought in consistently in the past year, okay? The second factor is uh, elusive, a broad public opinion, perception, that even if agreement is, stuck, is struck, it will be impossible to rely on the other side to deliver on the agreement. So why make an agreement if it's not going to be implementable? 
And that is much more psychological and elusive than the political factor, but it's in the same direction. Third major reason that is used consistently is that the ongoing violence has become in itself of an impediment and especially the growing gap between negotiations and the deteriorating situation on the ground. This is the third factor. Fourth factor relates to um, regional currents. The Arab Peace Initiative, which was promulgated twice in 2002 and 2007, did not get gain much resonance either in Israel and frankly not in the Palestinian Authority as well until recently. And therefore, without regional traction, there is a problem. Needless to say, the Iranian situation also impinges on regional currents. And um, the fifth factor is international inaction and primarily U.S. unwillingness to do more than um, nurture talks. And we're not in a situation where what is needed is only nurturing talks, perhaps much more uh, assertive action. And the final uh, reason I'm putting it on the table, I'll return to it very briefly at the end of my remarks, but you may want to pick up on it in the question and answers, is substantive. Perhaps there is a problem with the framing of the issues. The permanent settlement issues, uh, borders, Jerusalem, refugees, settlements, security issues, have been on the agenda and framed by Oslo, and perhaps that's not the right framing, or it's not the only kind of framing, and one has to think, rethink again the substance. But as I said, there is a tremendous amount of interest on creating the political conditions in Israel and Palestine to make a process workable and implementable. So what is going on today? Israel is now in the, it, at the beginning of the election campaign uh, or an election period. On February 10th, there will be national elections. These elections, by the way, were called because of corruption charges against Prime Minister Olmert. Since then, he has come up with amazing statements that no Israeli Prime Minister has ever articulated, which leads one to wonder <clears throat> what would have happened if um, the mouth had been moving in that direction perhaps a year ago, I suppose. We, by the way, have a great ability to produce politicians that, that when they retire, become extremely courageous. <laughs> I'm not sure you do. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I, I want to uh, discuss five dimensions of this campaign again, almost telegraphically. And I'm sorry I don't have an hour to do it, but, but I'll do the best I can. The first question is, what are the main issues on the agenda of the Israeli uh, election uh, period? What are the main issues on the agenda? Uh, Israel has been struck by the economic crisis belatedly because there were Jewish holidays for the first month <laughs> that it took place in, it, in the United States. Uh, but uh, belatedly, nevertheless, uh, the uh, some of the ripple effects are, are, are reaching Israel. And there's a, mother, ma, ma, a lot of discussion, and by the way, a lot of dissension on how to deal with, uh, with these issues. And uh, some uh, politicians and some parties are hoping that this issue will become number one issue on uh, the election agenda. I want to assure you that will not happen. The primary issue on the agenda is, has always been since 1967, and will continue to be questions of security and peace. They are not identical. They are linked, but they are not identical. And the security and 
peace issues will be number one. That's one of the reasons, by the way, there's a tremendous amount of discussion now in Israel about the Arab Peace Initiative. Intriguingly, it's just penetrated into the public discourse in Israel. Uh, the second issue is going to be economic, the economic crisis and its social ramifications. And I assume there will be a lot of discussion about religion and state and corruption, which has never affected it, the outcome of Israeli uh, elections, and therefore we have to assume it will not this time as well. I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the items on the electoral agenda in Israel are fairly fixed. They have been for years, and they are fixed this time as well. So where is the variability? The variability is in three very intriguing places. Number one, social policy, which I'm putting aside at the moment. Number two, Obama. And let me stop for a moment. When I say Obama, there is already discussion in Israel who will do better with Obama? Who will stand up better to Obama? Okay, who is his best friend? Nobody, by the way, on this, on the, among the key players, etc. Some of the newspapers have been running parallel op-eds. Uh, in the Jerusalem Post this week, there was an article by the former editor of the Jerusalem Post saying Bibi is a disaster uh, given the Obama presidency. And right next to it on the same page was an op-ed by a member of Knesset, Yuli Edelstein, from the Likud, in which he said, they met and there was a lot of chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but joking aside, the variability on the agenda does relate very interestingly to Obama that he's the Obama presidency per se nothing deeper than that is becoming a variable on the agenda um, list and a third item that's becoming a variable is is actually the violence or the possibility of war we have had elections determined by an escalation of violence just before elections, an escalation of terrorism just before elections. And I want to remind all of us that the West Bank in general, and Hebron in particular, during the last few week or two, and definitely in the past few days, is looking like the Wild West. And those kind of activities, which will require military action against Jewish settlers is going to be, become a point of contention. So what I'm saying is that while the agenda is fairly fixed, and when the agenda is fairly fixed, I would strongly advise looking for the variables. And right now the two intriguing ones are Obama and the escalation of violence of very peculiar sort. So that's number one is what are the issues? Number two are the personalities. And um, I want to say very clearly, this is now in terms of prime ministerial prospects, a two-way race. But Ehud Barak is out of the race. He is not a contender for prime minister, even though he would like to be. And he's probably hanging on for dear life to even be considered a candidate for minister of defense. This is strictly it's Ipi Livni versus Bibi Netanyahu race. Now having said that, it is the difference between a former prime minister who is trying to convince everybody that he has learned his lesson and is, is reformed. I don't know why you're laughing. I actually <laughs> didn't say anything. <laughs> and, 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 uh, Tibi Livni, who is very well known in Israel and, by the way, uh, respected for integrity, 
but has developed a reputation of being inexperienced and therefore not necessarily up to the task. Since we do not vote for prime ministers, but we vote for political parties, what one has to concentrate on necessarily is Likud, Kadima, but keep Labour and other parties in the back of your head. When the two front runners do not reach the stature of what one would hope a prime minister in a very sensitive period should be like, then the variability is not coming on the top in Israel now. Where it's coming is in the second tier and I advise you again to look at the second tier of personalities in order to see where innovation is taking place in Israeli politics. Uh, Netanyahu has collected a whole bunch of free agents and signed them up for the season. But he cannot get, guarantee them high positions on the list. The primaries will be taking place in some two weeks' time, a little over two weeks' time, in the Likud. And this includes, by the way, a very intriguing mixture of people, from Dan Meridor, who is right in the center in terms of his politics, to uh, uh, Benny Begin, who is the purest of the pure greater land of Israel uh, exponent and the son of Benachem Begin, and therefore carries a lot of cachet. And, the, and I must admit, everything from the captain of the first basketball team to win the European finals, and by the way, of American origin, Tal Brody, to uh, um, uh, some young and uh, interesting people uh, like Miri Regev, who was, uh, was the uh, IDF spokesperson during uh, the Second Lebanon War. The Likud is looking like a supermarket, and the personalities are interesting. There's, that's where the variability is going to be. But I want to emphasize two points about the Likud list. Number one, while you're watching this, and Israeli politics is fun from that point of view, while, while you're watching what transpires with the, in the Likud, do take note that the supposedly new faces are very old faces. That means they've all, they were either in politics in the past and are coming back or being hauled back in, or they held high positions, mostly military in the past, like uh, the chief of staff, Yalon, also very right wing, and are looking to get into politics, uh, to parachute into very high positions. So that's number one, they're not unfamiliar people. Number two, the Likud list at the moment, is being challenged from within by a very strong block of extremely right-wing uh, members of the Likud, headed by one uh, Feiglin, somebody known as Feiglin. And uh, Netanyahu has even tried to change the election rules in order to minimize the impact of that group, because if they succeed in bringing in a lot of members or affecting the outcomes of the primary, it is going to give the Likud an extremely right-wing aura, which I'm not sure is what Netanyahu wants. Uh, Kadima is also trying to sign up free agents, but has less money. And uh, therefore, there's some new, new people or, or contending, for example, Nachman Chai, but I would leave it aside. Labor tried to have its primaries yesterday, and the machines broke down. <laughs> and as I got on the plane last night, basically the, the, the story was, if they can't get, it can't get the machines to work, how can they get, get a government to work? And uh, they will go again to, to select their list uh, on Thursday, to actually tomorrow. They will do it without electronic support. And, um, there will not be, except for one perhaps new face on the list in any realistic position. Okay, so it's BB versus TP, and any variation is going to be on the second tier, okay, in terms of personalities. Let us look at the status of parties. The Likud dropped to 12 seats out of 120 in the last election. The polls are showing 35 to 37, front runner. The Likud problem 
is not a problem of party strength. It's a problem of party unity and cohesion. It's a very specific kind of party, a uh, problem. The problem of uh, Kadima is institutionalization. Kadima is a party that was formed before the last elections. It has not been institutionalized. The only way you will institutionalize is if it does very well in these elections. And labor has a serious problem of viability. Had 19 members. This is a founding party of Israel. Had 19 members in this election. The polls on Channel 2 two days ago showed six seats. Which, by the way, where your majority of voters are Jews is not bad because then people begin to feel sorry for you. <laughs> And I would suggest looking at the compassion factor in voting patterns as we proceed. And, and that I'm not being facetious. I'm really being quite serious. So where's the flexibility in all of this? The flexibility on the party scene is primarily in two places. And that is a lot of discussion of which I am heavily involved, I admit, on the formation of a new left to replace labor and to make up for labor's collapse. The foundation of the new left would be Meretz, my party, but it will include a lot of people uh, with strong labor connections in the past, if not in the present, and a lot of social change activists, etc. The second variability on the party scene, again, will be in a, a, a number of new parties that will attract a protest vote. I want to remind you that in the last election, the old age party, the pensioners party, got seven seats. Why? And 70% of their voters were under the age of 35. Because it was a protest vote. This is, we always find some, some channel to, for the protest vote and uh, right now, it looks like two green movements may be the channel for the protest vote if they do not unite with the new left party. So I would say the party scene is very fragmented and very problematic. And one, uh, uh, two last comments on, on, on what's going on inside Israel is the positioning. Where are the parties positioned? Allow me a very academic comment. In 2006 elections, for the first time in Israel's history, a center party became a ruling party. A center party won the elections and became a ruling party. That has never happened before. That means Olmert and Kadima were in the center, and the key rivals were Likud on the right and Labor Meretz on the left. It's the first time we've had that kind of positioning. These elections, I think, will not repeat this kind of positioning. What we will have in these elections is an attempt, which you see very well in Israel today, to color Livni left of center and make it a right-left <coughs> revival of the right-left struggle of the past with, in addition, which is very problematic, the right is going to be a very reinforced right. The left is, of Kadima is not really left, and the real left will be severely enfeebled. So the positioning of these elections is beginning to emerge somewhat differently than what we've known in the past. Finally, what's going to determine these elections, and you won't like me for this statement, but it's going to be two things, frustration and indifference. And let me explain why. Frustration evokes anti-politics, protest, okay? And it evokes protest when channeled well, as we saw on November 4th here, it can be extraordinarily powerful, extraordinarily powerful. But 
in Israel, what it means is frustration enables voter mobility. And voter mobility, if skillfully navigated, can lead in interesting directions. Okay, so that's frustration, anti-politics, mobility. The second thing that's going to determine the outcome even more than the first, the frustration, is going to be indifference. People are sick and tired of politics, of politicians, of promises, of corruption, and what they will do is do yoga on election day. Or they will go out and rent some very good DVDs and not show up at the polls. The outcome of the elections will be determined, I'm afraid, by uh, very low voter turnout, which might even skew the balance more in the direction that I intimated before. So uh, look at voter behavior as well. What's the prognosis? Fools prophesize about um, election outcomes two and a half months before they happen. But there are clear trends that I tried to analyze here which make me come to the conclusion that it is going to be either a much more right-wing government than the old government or a right-wing led government uh, or a deadlocked outcome or some kind of combination of all of the above that will require a national unity government which having said that is always a prescription for paralysis in Israel. So what does that mean in terms of looking at the political weakness factor, the Obama victory, and where does one go from here in, 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 in the search for a, a, a viable agreement between Israelis and Palestinians? I think the obvious thing to say is look elsewhere. Do not build at all on what is going to take place in Israel, but address the other issues. And here I will be super brief because Daniel and I have been corresponding on a lot of these issues and you've heard it, I'm sure, from them. I would suggest five things. Number one, internationalize the process. Number two, regionalize the solution. Number three, alter the situation on the ground in the Palestinian territories for the better, okay? Number four, if possible, if possible, make it very clear that there is a willingness to engage physically as well in order to assure implementation. And number five, reframe. Let me just few comments on the reframing and then I really will stop. Um, I am very concerned that there has been no attempt to repackage the permanent settlement issues in a way that they can actually be uh, dealt with uh, perhaps more constructively than the usual kinds of discussions that many of you have been involved in and are very familiar with. I would merely like to make on the reframing uh, issue three proposals. Number one, one has to recognize the asymmetry, not only on the ground but at the negotiating table between Palestinians and Israelis. And if there the working assumption is an assumption of asymmetry, then one of the most fascinating issues is how to label the playing fields in the negotiation in an asymmetrical situation because all the negotiations create a false symmetry. So one will have to do, one proposal is to deal with the symmetry, with the asymmetry issue. Second proposal is to do something that nobody had the courage to do up to now, 
and that is to go back to the root causes of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We've always thought that if we go back to history, we wouldn't be move forward. But I would like to suggest to you that it may be necessary to go back to history and to root causes in order to liberate ourselves from the past and move forward. Mm -hmm. And that is something that at least is a new potential agreement, uh, ingredient into the substance. And the third uh, suggestion I have on the substance is to begin to separate between uh, the occupation and the dismantlement of settlements. And if the purpose is to end the occupation and create a Palestinian state, then I don't see why it's always necessary to fix the settlements into the equation. It might be possible to end the occupation without dismantling the settlements, but just simply leaving the territory. This might involve some ideas of international trusteeship, which are again being bandied around. So uh, somebody said, what advice do you have for the new administration? Well, I don't give advice to old administrations or to new administrations, but there, except for one, which I can afford to do, the inauguration is on January 20th, the Israeli elections are on February 10th. I would wait 20 days until after the elections before announcing a policy. But I'm not sure I would wait 21 days. It is that urgent, because everybody knows that there's not going to be a two-state solution, implementable two-state solution, unless something is done very, very quickly. So this has to be at the top of the agenda, with the working <laughs> assumption that bilateral talks are a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And because bilateral talks are a non-starter, the U.S. role <laughs> is, is absolutely vital for any any kind of uh, movement, and uh, I would suggest that um, the United States might even, I'm not alone in this, suggest a plan with some of the parameters uh, that I indicated and perhaps even, um, I know there's a plan to uh, appoint a, an emissary but it's not just to get the sides to sit together and to go over the same ground they've been going out for, uh, for the past 15 years, but to perhaps to move in other places. What I'm saying is, at least in terms of Israeli politics, there's a lot of motion, but there's not very much movement. And if there's going to be movement on the, on the conflict, it's going to have to be propelled by outside forces. Thank you very much. That's a lot of uh, good food for thought. And uh, before we open the floor, I want to give Daniel a chance to elaborate on some of the points and comment on some of the points, and I'm sure provoke some further discussion. Daniel? Well, obviously, I want to thank Nomi for a phenomenal tour de force and, and for the optimistic note there that the Israelis would actually rent good DVDs on Election Day. <laughs> um, let me, let me take as my point of departure the, your closing comments, Nomi. Um, I would strongly endorse, and, and it's interesting that it's being endorsed from many directions, the idea that this next administration may well be the last administration that could realistically pursue a two-state solution. Um, if I would have thought about using that tactically in order to instill a sense of urgency into the conversation until recently, today I say it almost coming from a position that I worry that it is too late already. And I think to the, ex you know, to the extent to which in your point five, uh, I think that reframing will have to be, start to be more and more radical uh, the longer we wait. Um, when I see a Brookings uh, Saban Center and Council of Foreign Relations report, I don't know if we should plug other people's in New America, but I, I will. Um, when I see that report coming out yesterday, and then it came out in book form, and there's a, I think a phenomenal chapter here on the Arab-Israeli uh, issue, written by Stephen Cook and Shibli Talhami. Um, 
when I see that coming out and echoing the things that we've been saying here for the last year and a half, and that they have therefore clearly become consensus and establishment, I fear that we're now behind reality and we have to refresh our own thinking um, if Brookings and CFR have caught up with us. Um, and and, 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 and I, you know, I also say that as, 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 as having been involved, as Larry said, in the Geneva Initiative, I, I, I seriously wonder whether that um, specific solution is viable anymore. Um, and let me, let, let me unpack that a little bit, um, but I, w I don't want to take too long about this. Uh, first of all, in terms of what, what do they do in the first 20 days between Jan 20th and, and Feb 10th um, when we have our elections? Some were drawing an inference from, sorry, this is what President-elect Obama said introducing his national security team in Chicago on Monday. Um, there is much to do, from preventing the spread of nuclear weapons to Iran and North Korea, to seeking a lasting peace between Israel and the Palestinians, to strengthening international institutions. Those of us obsessed by this conflict, it wasn't lost on us that of three issues that the President-elect chose to highlight, here was, to me, encouragingly and somewhat surprisingly, Israel-Palestine featuring as one of those three. The conclusion that I'm not drawing from that, which some of my colleagues have been drawing from, is, is this going to be a mantra that one will hear repeatedly from the transition team and then from the president in advance of February 10th uh, in an effort to, to really make this more of a factor uh, even than it would already be in the Israeli election? I don't expect to see that happening. I'm not even sure if it's a good idea. In fact, I tend to think it's not a good idea. I'm not sure, to the extent to which one would imagine this is supposed to play into Tsipi Livni's advantage, I'm not sure she'll be in a position to turn that to her advantage. I think Netanyahu has done quite a good job so far, actually, of portraying himself as, 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 as at least equally Obama-friendly. And I think uh, Tsipi has slipped on a couple of banana skins of her own making um, in that respect. What I think you do have in the team that he introduced on Monday is, first of all, and very interestingly, someone who has spent a significant amount of the last period dealing day to day with the Israeli-Palestinian situation in the very senior position of being the National Security Advisor, uh, and that's General Jim Jones. Uh, and to the best of my understanding, at least, coming up <coughs> in the security arena, which was, his, um, which was the arena he was dealing with, coming up with some interesting and creative ideas along the lines of something that um, I think point four of Nomi's last five points, if possible, a willingness to engage physically in the solution. And I know that Jones was involved in developing the idea of having some kind of international slash NATO presence as, as the, the receptacle the receptive vehicle for what does Israel t turn over the territories to in, uh, in a security sense, uh, given the, uh, the expectation that there will not be too much Israeli enthusiasm to turn the, the uh, authority over to Palestinian security forces. So I think that's interesting. I think in, in, in Hillary Clinton, you have someone who, first of all, whose surname bears the name of the parameters to this conflict that were laid out in December 2000, albeit um, by her husband. But I think those Clinton parameters are in many ways still valid. And the approach represented by the Clinton parameters, albeit far, far, far too late in December of 2000, uh, and given what Nomi said, that we can't do this bilaterally, um, I think that's some, in, in many ways encouraging. I also think Hillary is incredibly well placed to carry uh, to carry the confidence of the pro-Israel, the traditional pro-Israel community <coughs> with her um, if she were to take a forward-leaning, uh, go-forward approach to this conflict. So I, I think there's much actually um, to be not so much concerned by, but rather encouraged by in, in that appointment. Um, for me, the worry is that, that, that the the instinct will be to do the opposite to what Nomi has suggested. That the instinct for an administration will be to say, thank heavens you bequeathed us Annapolis. We've got a process. It's a process that's already working. We can just continue 
with this existing process. We've got negotiations going on, we've got a nice setup on the ground, we've got special envoy Blair, we've got security representative Dayton, we're, we're working through the issues methodically, there's something to build on. And I think it's a recipe for, 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 for absolute and abject failure. Um, because I think there are, while I, I give some credit for the, the outgoing administration for finally in year eight, um, cottoning on to the fact that Israel-Palestine may actually have a resonance beyond the 12 million odd residents of those territories in the Middle East, in the Islamic world, and for America's interests. Um, I give them very little credit for having gone right back to the recipe of Oslo uh, in terms of how to go about actually doing this. So my concern is that one will continue where the current team have left off. If one does that as a declarative thing, if one says we're continuing Annapolis but actually introduces lots of changes to it, that's fine. If one actually continues Annapolis with all its content, I think that's very problematic. What gives me confidence is I, I do think that, that the way this administration is, 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 is beginning to look, they'll be far quicker and more adept at recognizing mistakes, recognizing dead ends, and responding to them and looking for new approaches. Uh, than the team that is uh, leaving office next month. And maybe just, just in closing to flesh out a couple of the things that Nomi said in terms of what is required in a change of approach. I would identify four structural failures and they very much fit in with Nomi's five conclusions. Um, not surprisingly, really. Um, in the current approach. The first is the idea that you can build a Palestinian state on a divided Palestinian house and that the solution is to drive Palestinian division further and further and further as if there is some magical resolution to this Palestinian division whereby Hamas can be vanquished. Um, again, let, let, let me plug this report. You know, it talks about the need to bring Hamas in to create incentives for Hamas not to be a spoiler. Um, and, and it has several other good conclusions. So the first thing is one needs a change in approach to the Palestinian internal situation. Uh, that does not mean, and it's a, it's a gross simplification and misrepresentation of, of, of the bring Hamas in position to, to suggest that this is uh, suggesting America needs to immediately engage with Hamas. The key thing is to recognize that it is indispensable to have Hamas inside the process and then get your allies to act on that. The American position thus far has been to veto Palestinian unity, and the position needs to change to encouraging Palestinian unity. That means encouraging the Arab states, not just Egypt. In fact, quite explicitly, it can't just be Egypt. Uh, you need Saudis and others involved, and I'd suggest to, to, to get Europeans to be more open and forward-leaning in their discussion with Hamas. The second one, really just to uh, totally echo Nomi, it, it can't be done bilaterally. You have a locked-in vested interest, I would suggest, from both sides right now to have endless negotiations without resolution. <coughs> For Israel, when even an Israeli leadership that says, in our long-term interest, we have to end this, we have to resolve this, we have to have a border, we have to have a two-state solution, even a leadership that thinks in that way, and I'm by no means certain that that will be the way that the leadership that comes in in mid-February thinks, even if you have that, when you then translate that into what is my short-term cost-benefit calculation, it almost invariably comes out that there's a short-term cost to actually doing a deal because of the, how politically difficult it is to hold together, because of the ruptures that that entails. And there, 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 there are, sure, there are benefits, but there are not enough costs on the other side of the equation. What are the short-term costs for continuing this situation? Um, and likewise on the Palestinian side. I now think you have a Palestinian negotiating team which when it considers the option of actually signing off on a deal and presenting it to its divided polity, especially given the prospect that you sign a piece of paper and nothing changes on the ground, I think they're terrified at closing a deal under those circumstances. And so you had the bizarre scenario last month in Sharm el-Sheikh, of Mahmoud Abbas and Sipi Livni meeting with the quartet, and the shared request that they made from the quartet is, allow us to continue our bilateral negotiations, don't present your own ideas. Allow this negotiation process to continue forever. 
The, th the third structural flaw that we have to overcome is the idea, and here is where um, Nomi referred to the, in, the uh, outside parties engaging physically and altering the situation on the ground, this idea that you can incubate Palestinian statehood under conditions of hostile Israeli occupation and an occupation that is duty-bound to protect and defend 280, a 280,000 civilian settler population widely dispersed across the West Bank that demands its own freedom of movement. That's ignoring the additional 200,000 plus in East Jerusalem. Under those conditions, to try and birth a thriving Palestinian economy or to try and birth thriving, effective, credible, internally legitimate Palestinian security forces, I would suggest is an absolute impossibility. And you need to find an alternative for that. That's why I'm very excited about the idea of, of there being increasing acceptance of the notion of Israel handing over to an international force, handing over to NATO, some kind of internationalization of the actual process on the ground. And the fourth structural flaw is to see Israel-Palestine in isolation. And as Nomi said, regionalize the solution. And I think this is the key for the next administration. If the next administration says, we have a problem, it's called Iran. That's the Iran trade. We have a problem, it's called Iraq. That's the Iraq tray. We have a problem, it's called the Israeli-Arab conflict. That's that tray. We have a problem called increasing extremism and instability. If you don't connect those, then you get what we've seen in the last years. If you do connect them, then I think you begin to regionalize a solution. It's, I, I, I really feel like I'm in a time machine when I see former Clinton administration officials arguing I, I, Syria first or Palestine first. And shame on them, really, and, including people who are good friends of mine. Um, you've got to begin to look at this comprehensively, especially given the context now of the uh, Arab Peace Initiative. Um, those, are, I think, are, are, are the structural flaws. Um, if I may make a comment on Bibi, Netanyahu, um, uh, we, we haven't discussed this. I imagine that when Bibi looks back on his first term as prime minister, he sees a not insignificant part of his downfall as having been linked to the way he tried to play an American president. Uh, my understanding of the trajectory of the unraveling of Bibi's coalition was that Clinton's, Clinton was much better, and Democrat presidents generally are much better at handling recalcitrant right-wing Israeli prime ministers than ostensibly uh, good, goodwill uh, center-left Israeli prime ministers. And Clinton's tireless efforts to bring Bibi back into the Oslo fold by slapping him to the Hebron Agreement, by slapping him to Y River in the close of 1998, shake Arafat's hand, make a deal to transfer another 13% of the territory, that led to the unraveling of his coalition. And Bibi tried to play internal games here. I don't know what conclusions Bibi Netanyahu has drawn. I'm not privy to that. But I think it's an interesting point of departure for thinking about how one would handle uh, the, the distinct possibility of a Netanyahu administration in, in, in Israel. Uh, I, I don't like the idea that just as you might have an American administration that's weaning itself away from the extremely unhelpful, unproductive war on terror narrative, that just as that might be happening here, you might get a, a very retro war on terror style leaderships in perhaps two frontline states, both in Israel and in India, where I think the chances of a BJP government coming in early next year are, are, are rather significant at the moment. Um, I think that's going to be a huge challenge, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that, that, that they couldn't come up with solutions to that. And, um, I, you know, bottom line, I'd agree with Nomi. I think um, if you define, as I think a number of, you know, important actors increasingly do, um, getting past, the, you know, getting, getting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a place where it is no longer such a, such a drag 
on America's credibility in the region, America's interests, is not such a mobilizing vehicle for, for our adversaries. If that is defined as an American interest, and one recognizes some of the structural flaws that we've outlined here, I do think there are ways forward, including um, in a Bibri reality. So I'm going to hand over to Larry to, to, to open it up. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, and again, thank you, Nomi. I think uh, we've heard uh, two very uh, interesting and important uh, presentations uh, about uh, how, to, how things are likely to move forward and how we might be able to help. And uh, I'll resist my temptation to ask questions and open the floor for others. Uh, Ambassador Lewis. Um, Sally sends her love, by the way. Thank you. Send it back. I will. I want to get back to your initial analysis of the internal political situation among the parties and ask you this question about either one of the two winners. How would you believe Bibi, if he is elected, would form the broadest coalition? How broad a coalition might he be able to form? And conversely, how broad a coalition would Zippy be able to form? Because one thing that I think we both would agree on is that unless you have a truly powerful coalition broad enough to back up daring decisions by perhaps undaring prime ministers, under pressures from Washington or elsewhere, the chances that you can achieve something from the Israeli side diminish very sharply. The, the 61 vote model won't produce dealing with the settlers, won't produce new thinking on the Palestinians. It'll produce probably a lot of stalemate. So the breadth of potential coalitions is crucial, I think. What do you think? Um. What, I'll let you answer that. Let me, let me just uh, add to Sam's point and, and just say both of you stressed the 20-day period and then the 21-day period, but doesn't what Sam is suggesting is that more important than what happens on February 10th going to be what happens in terms of the coalition formation uh, in Israel and how, how does that play out uh, both in terms of, um, you know, reactions from Washington and, and whether there is any role for Washington in influencing the coalition formation. Sam, please sit down. You're making me nervous. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sam, I'll answer your question directly. And again, it's almost impossible to predict because, as you know, at the end of Israeli elections, they start haggling for 21 days plus 14 days plus another 14 days. And eventually, when everybody is sure that no, no government is possible, they all go to the president. Uh, I think you're absolutely, if I understood the subtext of your question correctly, if BB wins this election, which there's a, a high li likelihood at the moment may change in a month, then I think his tendency will be to, say, to establish a national unity government, and he can go very broadly indeed, to include labor, to include uh, even some talk of merits. He'll definitely go right. He also has an option of setting up an entirely right government by any mathematics or calculus that we can make at the moment, okay? CP will be much more hard pressed to set up a national unity government. Her government in the first instance will in all probability be uh, center left with some religious parties and let me hasten to add that she failed to do precisely that two months ago when Olmert retired. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying subtext that Bibi's chances of a national unity government are much better. I agree with you. I think that's correct. I just want to add one comment. No national unity government in Israel's history has made a peace agreement or signed a significant agreement. They were all done by all Israel's significant agreements, and you know very well 
were done by narrower government coalitions, not by broad coalitions. Now, history is not always instructive, but it's every once in a while useful to refer to it. And, I, and, 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 and therefore, I would caution against over, being overly optimistic because what's important is not what kind of government, but what strategies exist elsewhere to deal with a national unity government versus a, a narrower government with much more political difficulties. And to tell you the truth, nobody, to the best of my knowledge, has gone to the trouble of doing these kinds of analyses, which are really critical. I just want to thank uh, Daniel for his really fabulous uh, remarks. I just want to tell him that the job of a discussant is not to affirm what the speaker has said, no, but, to, but, but to provoke <laughs> the speaker. And therefore, um, Bibi may have learned something uh, about his uh, downfall in 1999 as a result of his decision to confront uh, the Clinton administration. He may have learned that. Um, the question is, is the incoming president aware, again, of the range of possibilities one has with recalcitrant leaders elsewhere? Right here. The only thing I'd add to that is that, um, you know, people say that uh, at least Annapolis got them talking. They were talking beforehand, you know, and now they're still talking. So, as you say, you know, like they, they have an interest in doing that. I guess my question to both of you is that you talked about international involvement and, you know, physical involvement through NATO. But is NATO really the most appropriate vehicle for that? Wouldn't it be better to think of a UN? Um, umbrella which brings with it a, a much broader coalition and a se sense of commitment to international legitimacy. NATO, I mean, is overstretched, number one, and is, is an ideological vehicle. Why don't we take a, a couple of questions at a time and, and then we'll, Melissa. Melissa Maley with Sino Resources. To what do you attribute the new interest in the Arab League initiative? It's been on the table for a long time. Arabs have been talking about it rather consistently, uh, and yet that's never really gained traction. And I hope you go beyond the fact that the Palestinian Authority ran advertisements, because <laughs> that, that's a symptom as opposed to really a driver. Philip? Philip? I'm going to grab the microphone. The, uh, there is a, a perennial resort to the idea of having uh, some kind of international force there to make it all possible. Is the function of this international force a purely psychological one? And what sort of mandate would they have? Are they going to be authorized to shoot at Israeli settlers? Palestinian terrorists, a task which the mighty IDF hasn't been very good at. Uh, will some foreign force be able to uh, engage in the use of force uh, to perform this, or is it just a kind of reassurance for both sides uh, that will encourage them to uh, do the right thing? Okay, why don't we, uh, uh, Daniel and Nomi, why don't you? Why don't, you, why don't you start and then let know me, and then we'll do a second round of questions. Okay. I'm happy to start. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, it, it, and in terms of the, the uh, well, I guess, and, and Phil's question, in terms of, uh, first, NATO specifically. Um, my understanding, in terms of the overstretch question, what are you talking about? How could NATO possibly step up to this? American pleading can't try, you know, get that the Europeans to deliver any more numbers in Afghanistan. How on earth could one take on a new, uh, um, a new challenge like this? My understanding, including from talking to some, some Europeans on this, is if it's in the context, which also partially answers what, what you raised, Phil, if it's in the context of this is the missing 
link. This allows an agreement not only to be reached, but crucially to be implemented. It's this force or the Israelis ain't moving out, then I think you will see a willingness to step forward. In terms of the legitimacy question, um, for me, that falls under the rubric of things that are going to address the legitimate part of Israel's concerns um, in ways that are going to be more marketable and more palatable on the Israeli side that are worth doing. What you gain on that, I think, more than makes up for what one may lose um, in terms of the, in, the, the international legitimacy conferred by NATO as opposed to something else. I would fully expect <coughs> for this to be UN endorsed. I would fully, and, and I would very much call for a Security Council resolution endorsing whatever agreement was reached and whatever force would go there. Um, but I think there'll be far more confidence. Look, in 2006 in Lebanon, Israel did see a beefed up UNIFIL presence as part of the solution when it came to how one put the details of uh, Resolution 1701 together. But the, 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 the thrust there was with all due respect to the Nepalese and, and uh, Fijian battalions serving in, in Lebanon and UNIFIL, the importance was having German, French, Spanish, Italian uh, troops that would be part of the beefed up UNIFIL presence. I think here the, the expectation would be for it, to, to, for it to be something else. And Phil, I think the psychological piece of this is really important. I wouldn't, and, I, and you, I, I'm not suggesting you, you were kind of uh, downplaying by, by saying, is this psychological, downplaying the psychological significance. Um, it would be more than that. I haven't, but I, I, I hope to be involved in an effort in the near future that will uh, fleshed out in my own mind what the details of the mandate and the terms of reference would be um, for such a force in the West Bank. Um, in terms of one of your specific questions, I see this only happening in the context of the more traditional definition of deoccupation, which would also be the withdrawal of Israeli uh, settlers. So I think the, the uh, confrontation with settlers is a moot point, because there wouldn't be settlers there anymore. Uh, you, I mean, what I see is, is agreed border, Israeli withdrawal of its civilian population to that border, <coughs> stage one. Stage two, IDF then hands over an, an Israeli free, for, from a security perspective, area to the, uh, to, to the international forces, which over a, a more extended period of time uh, then hands over an increasing number of security responsibilities to the Palestinians. Um, and, and just one comment on the Arab Peace Initiative. Three reasons why there's been greater uptake. One, desperation. Um, two, uh, for some people, I think this is just another way of avoiding actually doing anything. What's the, 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 the latest way to pay lip service to, to being supportive of peace? But three, and, 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 and I'd hope this would be the more uh, significant reason, <laughs> It is, uh, is a recognition that, that it probably will take a regional comprehensive solution, uh, one in which Arab involvement backs up the Palestinian side and Arab involvement extends extra benefits to the Israeli side to actually get a deal done. Yeah, can I just... Uh, can, can I just... Uh, uh, let me pick up on that. I would add a fourth on, on the Arab Peace Initiative, and that is an understanding that the process started in Oslo and uh, corrected and elaborated in the roadmap and in Annapolis is dead-ended. And therefore, you need to find something else. I would go one step further now. If this has picked up even minor elements <coughs> of the Arab Peace Initiative are picked up now by the new administration, it will become, as you are want to say in this town, the only game in town. Right now it is, it, th if you want the fifth reason, the Arab Peace Initiative provides a certain amount of hope when all analyses of what is taking place leave one really quite depressed. And, 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 and 
uncertain about how to proceed. So there is an element of hope here, and I want to say as an Israeli that uh, probably I learned to speak and to, uh, uh, to say by heart the Israeli Declaration of Independence. This is a dream from ni of Israel since 1948. It is embedded in Israel's Declaration of Independence. And the possibility of achieving normalization with all our neighbors is something that goes way beyond what one, one can give any kind of specific concrete weight. So the fact that if I, the, uh, that element of the Arab Peace Initiative uh, has penetrated, I, I, I think is very important. I, I think dead ending and, and, and some glimmer of hope of something even greater is, is, is actually very exciting. Let me, let me just add one more, and it's a word that we barely mentioned, Iran. Um, I, I see the, the Arab, in, in how one could use the Arab Peace Initiative <coughs> as the diplomatic equivalent in terms of increasing leverage with Iran of what just happened economically, which really doesn't make sense unless I explain it for, for one minute. Um, I think what happened in terms of increasing in advance of a negotiation of increasing America's leverage on Iran, what just happened to oil prices has had far more effect than all the years of sanctions. And I think if America, in the context of engaging with Iran, were to be moving seriously on the Israeli-Palestinian front, were to embrace the Arab Peace Initiative, and were to open a new chapter with Syria, would have far more, would give far more leverage diplomatically then all the threats and all the saber rattling of the last years have as well. And I would see that as the diplomatic equivalent of what's just happened economically. Can, before we go, can I just ask, because the one point that I did think you were on different pages on uh, was the issue, Noam, you had put on the table very provocatively the idea of the settlers remaining even after a Palestinian state was established. And as I heard you, Daniel, just now again repeat that, you know, sort of the, even the beginning of the presence of the international force would require the settlers being removed. And so I, I wonder, Nomi, if you could just elaborate on that point, uh, because I think it is quite provocative for, for many of us uh, in this room. I have to get Again, I'm, I'm looking for areas where conventional wisdom can be re-examined. And conventional wisdom has been consistently that 1967 borders with adjustments by agreement will require the removal of tens of settlements and outposts, okay? Even if the larger settlement blocks are retained within Israel in exchange for a one-for-one -one swap, okay? The trouble is that there's a hardcore of settlers that will not move, doesn't want to move. Is actually every time there appears to be some kind of progress on, on, in the negotiations, then becomes more vociferous and at times even more violent. In other words, much of the previous negotiations have been mortgaged to the veto power of, of a really small portion of Israelis. I, I, I think, in a sense, the future of Israel has been mortgaged at times to this very small group. Now, having said that, then the question is, how, does one continue the same discussion. And some of you know me quite well. Uh, my political career started in the first demonstration against the first settlement in the West Bank, which tells you roughly how old I am. <laughs> okay? Uh, but with, and without erasing all previous of, of activity and hundreds of demonstrations, I'm saying maybe that route has to be reexamined now. And what, I'm say, what, what I said very clearly is to end the occupation means withdrawing to the international boundary or to an agreed upon boundary, and perhaps even transferring power in the first instance 
to an international trusteeship. Perhaps. Okay? Maybe not, maybe yes. But if it focuses on the settlements, then essentially it is entrenching the veto power. I have no interest in it doing that. But withdrawing without removing totally neutralizes the veto power. And therefore, it's an intriguing direction. And if you don't like it, then think about other things that, again, confront conventional wisdom. And by the way, just, just since I am standing up, up for one minute, Helena and, and, and Phil, I agree entirely with Daniel, what Daniel said. But what's the Cree breakthrough? Always look for the breakthroughs. Until 2006, Israel uniformly resisted international troops as a mode of protection. But 1701 altered that. That was a precedent in terms of Israeli policy, always use these precedents in order to continue to build on them in more complicated places. And therefore, it's the principle that's important. And once the principle is accepted, then which organization, what functions, etc., those are, that's almost easy in comparison. One more round, uh, one, two, Three, and in the back four. Go ahead. Uh, introduce yourself, Sajid. Yeah. Um, Sana Mandolini. Uh, two, two questions. One is, Naomi, name, name, you talked about reframing the issues. I was wondering about the question of reframing of the process, not just in terms of the regionalization and internationalization, but actually bringing it back down to make it a bigger tent of the local actors, of the civil society, and not just Hamas, but really of not just the spoilers, but the ones who are also part of the peace camp, and, and the platform that you have of people-to-people -people processes that have been going on, but engaging them in the issues, the real core issues, so that they're part of the discussions and the solutions. The second thing is the question of Iran that you mentioned, and, and Washington consensus is that Iran is bad and nasty and so forth, but um, we, you, you mentioned the question of leverage, using the Israel-Palestine process to leverage Iran, which is, which is a sort of more standard way of thinking about things, but in a sense, U.S.-Iran engagement in and of itself, if it's done with an understanding that we're gonna, it's going to be respectful engagement, not just you know uh, putting pressure, could actually be hugely effective and positive for, for Israeli security. Because if that, if that relationship is established, Iranian rhetoric against Israel <laughs> will naturally go down. And in 2003, they put Hamas and Hezbollah support on the table. So I'm um, thinking about out of the box. Thank you. Thank you. Right behind you. Uh, one area, and I'm when I would take my walks and all that, I, I think where can we make progress? <coughs> one area that has not absolutely been touched at all is the refugee issue. And I feel this, not in terms of getting a final solution, but we have, of course, the issue of the right of return, but the idea of a series of gestures by Israel with the support of the international community to the refugees. This would have a tremendous ameliorative effect because the refugee issue in some aspects is more fundamental than the issue of the, the so-called 67 issues. And that would involve some Palestinians being repatriated to Israel, but mostly it would be an effort to improve the lives of the refugee camps, not only in the West Bank and Gaza, but also outside. Okay. And uh, let's, let's, I mean, I just want to, let's get the four sure. questions on the table and then we'll, it's two right here, third. First, thank you both for a very interesting session. Introduce yourself, please. Introduce yourself. Um, uh, really, two questions. I think what you've uh, said is that um, the era of uh, sort of laissez-faire with Bush is coming to an end. And there's going to have to be a more activist position by the United States, which means that we're not going to let the lunatics run the asylum anymore, and that basically Obama will have to do some headbanging. And with that means there has to be some muscle attached to it. And with muscle comes threats. So my question to you on this issue is what kind of muscle can the American administration apply to Israel? And in order to get what you're talking about started with the international community and so on, and what parallel muscle can they apply to the Palestinians? Because the Palestinians don't have as much to lose. They've lost plenty already. 
the second part of my question really is, if we talk about an international approach, <coughs> what are China's and Russia's interest in this, and could they impede everything that you've been saying? Thank you. And last in the back, the office. Right over there. Stand here. Dave Ahern with Space and Missile Defense Report. Um, ass assuming that uh, Bibi Netanyahu is elected, and uh, uh, how, how do you see uh, President Obama working with him on the existential question of Israeli security and protection from missile attack, uh, especially Iran? And specifically, uh, uh, do you see a chance that uh, Obama would work as diligently as President Bush to create a European missile defense system that would have, of course, its main object knocking down any missiles that Iran launches. Okay. Um, I'm not sure the last one will uh, be necessarily answerable, but, but um, we got several good questions on the table, and uh, we'll, we'll let uh, who, do, who wants to start? Daniel? Um, we, we, we've divided these a bit between us. So um, on, on Iran, um, I mean, what I intended was um, that, that, that um, what, it, what is the regional environment that is going to be most conducive to a successful broad-based Iranian-American engagement? In other words, if one's not saying, OK, there's one subject on the table, it's Iraq or there's one subject on the table, it's nuclear non-proliferation. If it's a broad-based engagement, then I think that you're more likely to be effective if those things that I mentioned. But of course, the flip side to that is, if that engagement is successful, then of course it creates new opportunities <coughs> on the Israeli-Palestinian track, because one of the issues would be Iranian support for, uh, materiel support for groups who, who, who have used indiscriminate violence against Israelis. So, so I, I absolutely agree with, with, with the approach that you are suggesting there. Um, a word on Russia-China. I really think that the <coughs> Russian-Chinese position, that their respective positions on this, will be a, a derivative of what is going on, more broadly speaking, in those two bilateral relationships, the American-Chinese and the American-Russian bilateral relationship and much less a function of specific things to do with Russian and Chinese interest in the Israeli-Arab conflict. In other words, I think the, to the extent to which we're on a collision course with either of those powers, yes, they may put a spanner in the works to something America might be trying to do in the Middle East. To the extent to which one isn't on a collision course, I see no reason to think that they would do that, which kind of links into the missile defense question. The Bush approach to Russia as I understood it was, we want you to do A, B, C, D, E, and we're going to try and trip you up on X, Y, Z, K, L, M, N, O, P. Rather than saying, our priority is X. Now let's see how we can reduce tensions across a range of other issues. And there was no apparent capacity or interest to do that prioritizing exercise. So you say, we want you to cooperate on Iran, and then we, you say, we're going to uh, provoke you with uh, the missile defense shield in Europe. I hope that that's reconsidered by this administration because I don't think it makes any, any sense at all. I don't want to give a, a lengthy answer on the muscle question. All I'll do is uh, quote the uh, eminent folks at CFR and Brookings to you, um, specifically on the issue of freezing settlement construction. They say the following. Press Israel to free settlement construction. Both public criticism, I'm quoting here, both public criticism of Israeli settlement policy, as well as conditioning portions of aid to a settlement freeze, can be effective in eliciting Israeli compliance. So I'm not saying it. CFR and Brookings are suggesting America considers conditioning aid on an Israeli settlement freeze. 
know me, and I hope you'll take up the issue of the, uh, the process of involving others besides uh, uh, the government. No problem. I'm sorry, it's the teacher and me or the politician, I'm not sure which, that I really insist on seeing the people I'm speaking to. Um, so again, very, very quickly, there was a question of broadening the process to include civil society. I actually, in a world that is all good, I would have liked a very transparent and very consultative process with a great deal of uh, civil society participation. Uh, of all the negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians to date, the Annapolis talks are the most hermetically sealed in terms of what precisely is taking place there. So essentially what's happening now is precisely the opposite of a more open process. And I would like to remind us all that one of the failures of the second Camp David summit in 2000 was a result of the fact that there was almost no relationship between what was being discussed at the negotiating table and what the public knew. And it was the breakdown in communication with the public that probably prevented some things from moving along at actually absolutely critical decision-making uh, 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 times. And, and I think one does not repeat the same mistake twice, but I don't see that happening now. Uh, the Our Peace Initiative is now attaining a civil society dimension. There's a petition that went out to all civil society organizations in Israel yesterday. And it, and it really is burning up the, the cyberspace, at least in Israel. Uh, that's number one. Number two, there's a question about refugees. When I said going back to the roots of the conflict and reframing, I was referring specifically to that. When you talk about refugees in terms of numbers, you haven't done anything. When you talk about refugees in terms of Israel standing up and saying, we share responsibility for the creation of the refugee problem, then you're creating a totally different climate for serious discussion on what options are available at this point. And that's what I'm talking about when I say going back to the roots of the conflict. Okay? I know it's audacious, but if you think I'm being terribly audacious, a very important paper was written for the National Security Council in Israel some four years ago recommending precisely that step. And I, I'm very sorry that wasn't picked up because I think, again, that sometimes you have to understand that what is being discussed is not 10,000 or 150,000, but it's some recognition of the fact that there are two narratives of 1948, and you have to understand them even though you don't have to accept them. That's reframing. And one thing about muscle, if I may, where's the muscle person? <laughs> okay, I agree, as I'm a woman, and women have learned a long time ago that you can knock heads together without muscle. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, probably appropriate note, I want to uh, thank both uh, Nomi and Daniel for sharing their perspectives on these issues uh, with us. Uh, and thank again the New America Foundation for hosting um, this uh, program. Uh, and thank all of you for uh, joining us for the uh, discussion.